Hello everyone, welcome to India News TV here in Brisbane, Australia. Today we are bringing to you a very fascinating and engaging discussion on parties in revival giving meaning to ambition. This discussion focuses on the Australia-India strategic partnership in the context of the evolving security architecture in the Indo-Pacific. The discussion is moderated by Melissa Conley-Tyler based at the University of Melbourne and the panelists include Australian diplomat Harinder Sidhu, former Indian diplomat Mr. Navdeep Suri and the director of the National Security College in Canberra Mr. Rory Metcalf. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Um, are, uh, are great advocates and ambassadors for Australia in India um, and uh, and you know it's always struck me strange actually that Australian education didn't feature much more strongly in the mm. Indian mindset. Um, my family background is from Singapore and of course for decades uh, Australia was the go-to place for for education. Um, so, you know, it always seems strange to me that in India that wasn't so much the case, but it's certainly changing now. Um, and I, I really do think that that is the glue because um, Navdeep's got um, fabulous experience on the cultural diplomacy side as well, which has been uh, really important, uh, a way of showing really how we can collaborate uh, and work together to produce really fantastic outcomes as well. So and just that three dimensional view. So, so Navdeep. Well, I think uh, apart from that, um, you know, uh, uh, the Americans have done this fairly well, which is that uh, young uh, uh, Americans have been coming to some of the uh, tech firms in Bangalore and other places and doing internships and, uh, and, and even coming to work for a while. Um, I was in uh, uh, Bangalore about three, four months back with a, a fintech uh, company that's been doing very well. I was quite surprised to see that one of their uh, um, uh, senior executives was a Chinese woman. Um, and uh, uh, she said she'd been around and uh, she was uh, working in Bangalore and uh, uh, establishing a lot of relationships. And she said there were like well over 5,000 Chinese nationals in, in Bangalore. Um, uh, the Americans are probably 25,000 or more. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, is there a process where young Australians would look at, uh, you know, that, that kind of an experience uh, on the job, getting to know the business, getting to know the companies, uh, the working environment. Uh, that could be one um, interesting area to try and develop uh, and put some mechanisms in uh, place. On the other side, also, I think um, uh, some initial work was done on uh, vocational education and uh, skills and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, I know there were initial challenges as well, but uh, you know, to the extent that that's such a large priority area, um, what I always thought was an interesting challenge was to take Australia's uh, skills model, which is very efficient, very effective, but it's also kind of a high cost, low volume uh, model, and to see whether it could be adapted to Indian requirements of a lower cost, higher volume uh, kind of a tra training uh, uh, system so that instead of trying to get tens of thousands of Indians to Australia for skilling, we take the trainers into India and uh, develop that. So, I mean, I wanted to say that, but also I want to, since you've given me the, uh, the mic, I wanted to take the uh, uh, liberty of uh, uh, saying that um, there are a few areas of interesting cooperation that don't get talked about uh, and and perhaps in the next round uh, uh, my question to harinder would be that you know how about stuff that is sub substantive and solid but doesn't make the headlines um, uh, the collaboration in mining at dhanbad or in the agriculture or the dairy farming or the sports uh, or sports medicine or all of the other things that are kind of happening quietly in the background uh, and perhaps also devote a couple of minutes to that because I'm sure lots of people are completely unaware about that. Mm. Sorry, can I just quickly re reply yeah. to that? For a yeah, second? please do. So, just, um, so I, I know you've been talking about this kind of getting Australians to, and in fact, that's been happening under the new Colombo plan. So that's been phenomenally successful. We didn't expect to have quite so many Australian students want to go to India, but I think we cracked over a thousand last year. And wow. they are working. Um, they are working 
in places. Uh, so uh, particularly the Indian consultancy companies, the Tata Consultancy Services, the Infosys, etc. They host significant numbers of these interns every year now. Uh, and it's it's really so since you've been engaged, this is one of these things that have happened just in the last couple of years, quite clearly inspired by your passion of the I'm sure. Um, but you're also right. Um, there are an awful lot of other activities that the genuine science and technology and research partnerships that uh, such as the India at the Indian School of Mines in, in Dhanbad, where we bring our expertise and Indian capabilities together. We're actually building something new out of all of that. Um, there are so many areas in terms of agricultural development, etc., that we're working on. And the list is very long, but uh, it will take the rest of the day. So I'll just leave it there. But you're exactly right. We're doing an awful lot. We're trying, and, and we just hope that the new Columbo Clan scholars can can start travelling again soon. Uh, yes. a, a real loss this year that they haven't been able to continue the program in the same way. So, so Rory, do you want to come in? Oh, look, I, I won't. Uh, take too much of the um, the thunder on this one. Just to say that uh, I, I, I teach quite a few Indian students and I would love to have uh, more of them over here, especially because of the, frankly, the challenging critical thinking that they often bring uh, to uh, to their studies here in Australia. Uh, and that's, again, I think a, a reflection of our, um, our shared values. Mm -hmm. Very much. Well, look, I, I might move to my last question then. Um, we're watching the relationship and we're wanting it to build. How will we know that we're succeeding? I mean, what are the indicators we're looking for? Um, what are the, the steps we want to see happening? Um, so for my, for, if I could just start again with Harinda, I mean, what indicators do you watch to see whether the relationship continues to grow and build? So uh, it's two things really. It's whether we're thinking more about each other. And I, I really think that particular, what we're seeing with COVID is, um, an acceleration of our engagement with each other. And Rory mentioned earlier, you know, was, you know, in the midst of a global crisis, that the Australian Prime Minister and the Indian Prime Minister sit down together and have a summit is pretty extraordinary. That we even yeah. thought to do that um, is a pretty yeah. extraordinary step. So I do think that um, that signals very strongly to me how far we've come along that road. Um, but then I wanted to pick up Navdeep's point, which he made earlier, which is it's just not thinking and talking, it's actually doing things together. So we're still, I think, very much of the thinking part, but it's actually when we start landing work that we're doing jointly, um, be it in development projects or in, um, in, uh, in other dimensions, we're moving along that, um, particularly in the military and defence sphere, but we do need to broaden that out. But I think that that's how we'll know, because when you think about, you know, I said that at the start we wanted to be the two strongest friends in Asia. Well, I'm, I had my mind sort of the way Australia and Japan have our relationship. Mm. And, you know, so that's a very natural, organic relationship where we work together on a lot of fields. And this is kind of what we should be reaching for. Mm. Absolutely. Nafti. Um, you know, um, diplomacy is hard to quantify, uh, but to the to to, to the extent that uh, you, you can, uh, I, I'd love to see uh, uh, much more uh, investor interest from Australia into India um, as as one. I'd love to see uh, some of the um, uh, low hanging fruit being plucked quickly in terms of our new mutual logistic support agreement or a maritime. Wind awareness arrangements and so on, uh, because I think the, the timing is very good to do that. And both sides' leadership is, uh, you know, strike it while it's hot. We've got a, a momentum behind us, and this is really make the next six months count. Is what I would say, and try to tick several of those key boxes over the next six months so that you've really got deliverables uh, that that uh, uh, show the intent. And is that, do they need to be public ones? Do, do they need to be in the newspapers or is it more that we're seeing that happen behind the scenes? Well, some of them should be public. Uh, you know, um, you don't have to disclose all of the details. There is no reason why, because to me, as I said, some of this, uh, uh, what's happening currently, uh, whether it's coercion or uh, other words, uh, it's psychological as well. 
and and and, and to, that is why i think the kind of signals that emanate out of a growing uh, relationship on the defense and security side and including on the economic side in terms of those diversification strategies and so on there are messages out there that will not be missed and you roar oh i would actually pick up directly from uh, what not they said there because uh, you know, for me, a measure of success is that uh, we're, we're, we're natural partners, not just bilaterally, but with, with other groupings now in this region to deal with the big challenges of the time. And that I guess we almost automatically find convergence and solidarity on some of these big security issues. I like the way that some, I think as, um, as we just heard from Harinda, that, that Australia and India now think of each other in that first rank of partnerships. We automatically uh, look at what, how one another will assist uh, on a particular issue and we're open to one another's interests and sensitivities. That is, it is hard to quantify, but if, if we get those things right, then all of the rest will follow. And I guess just one last word of caution, if you like, um, and that is again about uh, making the ambitions realistic enough that we can also cope with disappointment so that we've got enough buffers because there will be shocks there will be moments where we have you know minor manageable differences but we have free press and we don't want these things to get out of hand i'm confident that we're building up those buffers now uh, because it's going to be a very disruptive decade for both our countries and i think you know australia and india uh, are now going to be in really the the core group uh, that is part of the solution a disruptive decade again ahead. Yes, I think we can probably all agree with that comment. Um, so look, I'd like to thank the speakers so much for sharing their time and their uh, insights today. As I say, we were very, very lucky to have uh, such a distinguished group. So Ambassador Harinda Sidhu, Ambassador Navdeep Suri and Professor Rory Metcalf, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to the sponsors of this stream, the Australia stream. Uh, so to the Newland Global uh, Australia India Institute at my university, the University of Melbourne, AsiaLink, where I used to work, uh, Australia India Business. Business Council, Asia Society, Indian Link, uh, Trade and Investment Queensland, Chamber of Commerce WA and Global Victoria. Uh, now, there, please don't leave. There is another excellent session coming up, moderated by Natasha Jarvaska from Newland Global. Um, it's looking at reviving manufacturing, uh, co-innovating, co-collaborating and co-creating in the Indo-Pacific. So we're supposed to leave you five minutes to go, get your cup of tea, whatever else you need to do. Be back in five minutes for the next session. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.